Today I would like to speak about male fertility and in particular I will focus on some aspects of male infertility and uh, I would like to start with this uh, interesting paper that uh, came out in 1982 on the New York Times and what we are seeing on this that um, before this potency and fertility were considered almost synonymous. Can you imagine, like 50 years ago, potency and fertility were the same. When there was a, a couple that could not uh, conceive, all the fault was the female, and uh, otherwise unknown causes were given as the reason of impossibility to conceive. Today, 2017, on The Guardian came out this paper that says that infertility crisis is beyond doubt. Now, scientists must find the cause. There is another research from University of Jerusalem that saying that uh, in uh, 40 years, the male fertility halved and that uh, about 1.4% per year is decreasing the male fertility. So you can imagine how big is this problem, how we should take care about this, and not only about female problems. These are the group from Q8, they focused on uh, sperm and they made um, a question. Could we use the sperm as the paradigm of um, our health? Is it possible to use sperm to see how much is our health? Maybe yes, because what they are saying is that there are two evidence that are connecting the um, fertility with uh, our um, lifestyle with how our comorbidities. So in general, they notice that people having comorbidities like diabetes, like uh, hypertension and all of this kind of uh, problems, they have uh, lower fertility. Plus, couple that they have a uh, couple that have a child, they live longer. So starting from these two points, they analyzed if there is any relation between fertility and male health. In general, what they concluded, they focused on the smoking, diabetes, hypertension, and they saw that all these kind of comorbidities are able to decrease the fertility status of this kind of people. It's really interesting to see with the microscope how is different the spermatozoa of patients with the diabetes and of patients without this kind of disease. You can see really a completely different structure of the sperm all the parts of the spermatozoa are different, uh, the head, the acrosome, the midpiece, and even the tail of the spermatozoa are completely different in these patients. So in conclusion, what they said is that um, it's still too early to say that the sperm could be the mirror of our health. But maybe in the future we could take into consideration even this as a parameter of interesting of our health. And even there is a strong relation between our lifestyle and our fertility. So take care about your lifestyle because your fertility will suffer from your correct or incorrect lifestyle. Talking about male infertility, which is the size of the problem? So what we are talking about? Approximately 80 millions of couples worldwide, they suffer from infertility. So you can imagine how big is the size of this problem. And Further than this, we have to say that, again, the lifestyle is something that is uh, changing completely our status of fertility. And further than this, about 15% of couples are infertile, and 50% is depending on male factor. So this is something that all of you knows, but this is to understand the size of the problem. Which are the causes of male infertility? Do we have enough causes for male infertility? What do we know about fertility? For sure, what we have to notice is that 30% of male infertility causes are unknown. So up to 30% we can consider as idiopathic infertility. And what we know about known causes? About known causes, we know that varicocele is the most important cause because it's up to 15% of causes of male infertility. And again, there is a strong relation between Drugs, smoking, diabetes, cancer, and whole comorbidities are related directly with fertility because they are able to increase oxidative stress, they increase damages to the sperm, and so our fertility will suffer from this. 
And what about the diagnosis? We have even some problem regarding diagnosis. Are we able nowadays to do a correct diagnosis of male infertility, which are the items that we have and that we can use to reach a correct diagnosis of male infertility? What do we, do we have? We have the semen analysis that is uh, something that is old fashioned, but is really important because it's an, it has a really important role in the diagnostic routine, but unfortunately is not able to detect uh, all of these abnormalities. So we have to still do the semen analysis and we have even to consider the latest version of the WHO that is the fifth and this 2010 version of the WHO and we have to strictly follow this criteria to have a correct semen analysis because in the last version of the WHO semen analysis has even been introduced the quality um, and the quality control and even the um, assurance of quality. So make sure that the semen analysis has been done in the correct way. Further than this, we can do an, endoc an endocrine evaluation. So all the testosterone, LH, F8, FSH, PRL and inhibin should be always evaluated in a man that is suffering from fertility. And in all these cases that you have a severe oligoastenototeratozospermia or you have a severe case of infertility, even genetic testing should be done always. So the microdilation, the cystic fibrosis and all the other chromosome parameters should be evaluated as a genetic pattern because this can be even causes of male infertility. And which are other tests that we can do today that can help us understanding better the fertility. Unfortunately, we are still not able to understand everything, but for sure we can assess the oxidative species, the reactive oxygen species, because this can be a cause of early fertility, and plus we can analyze the chromatin, so we can do the DNA fragmentation, and we have different and several kind of way to evaluate these parameters, and this will help us in a better diagnosis of the quality of the sperm and the quality of the fertility of the man. Let's talk about the varicocele issue. So we said that varicocele is really important. But what do we know about varicocele? Is there a relationship between varicocele and infertility? Are we sure about this? And after having treated the varicocele, the fertility status will increase or won't change anything? So what, how can we reply to these two questions? If we start from 2003 for this paper, for example, they were saying, the Cochrane Review, that there is no evidence to treat varicocele because there is no evidence that treating varicocele can help the fertility status. In the same year, Professor Agarwal and his group, they already started saying that there is a strong correlation between varicocele and the oxidative stress and the DNA fragmentation. So they already started postulating that varicocele can be an important reason of infertility. 2006, there is a contrary opinion. So there is someone that is starting to say that maybe we could take in consideration varicocele. And we arrive today that uh, the most important meta-analysis, they say that there is a relation between varicocele and fertility. So we should treat varicocele because it can help us in the fertility status and in the pregnancy rate expectation. And another paper to 2016 is important because it's analyzing um, varicocele even in accordance with the status because we have um, varicocele but we can have normal fertility. We can have varicocele and we can have abnormal fertility. So this paper is concluding that there is a suggestion to treat varicocele on only when you have an oligo asteno teratozoospermia. Otherwise, when the situation of your fertility is normal, it's not suggested to make any treatment of the varicocele. And this is exactly why I wanted to show this, because the last version of the European Association of Virology Guidelines 2018, they trace a report about varicocele. They say that it is associated with progressive testicular damage, that there is a significant risk of overtreatment because maybe we treat too many varicocele. Not always varicocele is able to create a problem in the fertility. And that varicocele repair should be done only when you have a problem in the fertility on when you have a damage on the testes. So this is the final recommendation of the latest version of the guidelines. Which is the best treatment of the varicocele? For sure, the surgical treatment is the best way because if you 
if we speak about medical treatment, unfortunately we don't have nothing to treat with, med with medication. But surgery, between surgery, in the, these years, we have so many kind of treatments. So even about this, we have radiological ways and we have a surgical ways. By the end, it seems from the latest uh, um, report and from the side effects and from the results of all kind of these procedures, that the microsurgical approach maybe is the better in the treatment of varicocele because is is um, the way in which we can have less side effects and better results. Let's move a bit on oxidative stress, because we understood that varicocele is able to create a damage. But where is this damage? How can we approach this damage? What can we change in this damage? Sperm is really able to receive so many damage because in the head, in the midpiece and in the tail, you, in all the part of the spermatozoa, you can consider a chance of receiving a damage. You have to take in consideration that uh, the sperm is like, uh, that the reactive oxygen species are like the pinballs that bounce over the, of the spermatozoa, creating damages. This is why what we have to take in consideration is exactly the correct balance of reactive oxygen species and the oxidative stress because uh, ROS are able to create a membrane damage that brings to the instability of the membrane and the final result is the cell death. This is why when you have a moderately elevated concentration, you have uh, the immobilization of the sperm. While when you have a high concentration, you have the lipid peroxidation and the final cell death. So it, there is a, a direct relation between the amount of ROS and the quality of the sperm. Even at the mitochondria, all of you know that mitochondria are the most important part for the energy metabolism of the cells of the spermatozoa. And the reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress is able to create damages inside the mitochondria, so is able to alter all the energy met metabolism of this kind of cells. And again, we have to, to stress that is the balance between re reactive oxygen species and the clearance of the reactive oxygen species that should be keeping the correct balance because a small quantity of reactive oxygen species is on the other side necessary to keep a correct action, to keep a correct function of the sperm. And what is difficult is exactly to keep the correct balance because even taking out too many reactive oxygen species is not healthy for the sperm. So the balance is the word that we have to keep in mind. Carnitins. Carnitins, they, they are um, old molecules, but uh, nowadays are really effective on uh, taking care about the reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress. Because they are able to bring energy inside the cells, and they are even able to take out toxins from the cells. So they have a double action, and they are able to create so many um, good effects on this kind of cells. What is the literature saying about carnitins? There is this paper of Balercia and al et al, that is 2005. They analyzed 60 patients. And in my opinion, this paper is interesting because they analyzed, first of all, three different kinds of carnitines. Because they analyzed the L-carnitine, the acetyl L-carnitine, and the association of these two carnitines. And what is interesting is to see that all the parameters of the sperm have increased in these patients. And what is interesting, that is the best results you will obtain of, with the association of the L-carnitine with the acetyl L-carnitine. And further than this, uh, we can say that uh, the sperm is better, that the parameters are, are better. But what is really important to evaluate in this kind of patient? The pregnancy rate. Because what the patient wants is the children. So the pregnancy rate is the most important parameters. And as a secondary endpoint on this paper has been evaluated even the pregnancy rate, and the nine pregnancies out of 12, it occurred in patient uptaking the supplementation. So even on the pregnancy rate, we have significant results with this kind of products. Two years later, they came out with a, a meta-analysis in which they analyzed the, almost all the literature on the carnitines. And even the meta-analysis is in favor of the treatment because as you can see from all these uh, graphs, all the parameters of the sperm are in favor of the treatment. And again, even the pregnancy rate, that is this one, is strongly in favor of the treatment with carnitines. So this is almost saying us that even in pregnancy rate, we have statistically significant results with these products. 
But look at something more recent, because uh, nowadays we look at the DNA fragmentation as an important parameter. And again, with varicocele, because the DNA fragmentation is increased in patients with varicocele. Which are the results? Unfortunately, there is only one paper that is relating DNA fragmentation, varicocele, and carnitines, and this is of 2015. But even on this paper, that the number of the patient is not so big because we are talking only about 20 patients, results are in favor of decrease of DNA fragmentation after uptaking carnitines. And uh, this is the last one that I want to present you on the carnitines because um, they are focusing on uh, two topics because they are saying that uh, what kind of medical therapy we have today for this kind of patient. We have hormonal therapies and we have antioxidants. But when we talk about antioxidants, there are millions and millions of products, millions and millions of things. So are they effective or not? In general, we can say that they could be a promise or a panacea. So which is the, the answer? Unfortunately, in accordance with guidelines, we still cannot suggest any products for this. But this paper that is analyzing all the other papers is concluding that there is a, an evidence that uh, the live birth rate compared with controls is uh, strongly in favor of supplementation. So even if the guidelines are not suggesting still this kind of medical treatment because they're considering surgery as the treatment of varicocele, but there is evidence that the live birth rate increase in this kind of patients. The final part of my presentation will be on our experience because um, I just uh, focused on the problems that we are facing with. But which is our experience? So we started our experiences many years ago, and I'm continuing the experience with the, um, with the carnitines. And um, this year we came out with uh, an interesting paper that uh, focused on um, the effect of an antioxidant association on patient with the oligo astenotrotozospermia and um, with or without varicocele and patient with placebo and patient taking the, uh, the supplementation. The importance of this study is that it's a double-blind placebo-controlled studies. Unfortunately, if you make a review of the literature, it's really lacking many papers double-blind placebo controls. And as all you know, that are really important to make this kind of studies. So this is the, how we draw in our study. We have 104 patients, 52 with varicocele and 52 without. And then all the, all the groups have been divided between those uptaking the placebo and those uptaking the supplementation. Results are interesting and we focused on the semen analysis and on and all of them, all of the parameters. So motility, concentration and sperm count. All of the parameters between varicocele and non-varicocele are statistically significant and are in favor of the treatment with supplementation. And all of these parameters are even more evident in a patient suffering from varicocele. So this gives, gives us again the, the reason that varicocele is able to create a damage, is able to increase reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress. And these kind of products are able to decrease this damage and are able to reach better fertility. But even in patients without varicocele, all the parameters are statistically significant. And once again, as a second end point, we focus on the pregnancy rate because pregnancy rate was reported in 12 couples of patients that were enrolled in the study and 10 were in patient uptaking the supplementation. Other two were in placebo group and one became an abortion. So this is a secondary end point, but as a secondary end point, it's statistically significant as in, in favor of the treatment. Further than this, we are now focusing on other parameters because we want, we want to see, since I said to you that lifestyle is really important on the quality of the, of the sperm, on the quality of the fertility, so we, make, we took the same patients and we made a, real, a correlation between body mass index and between the age of these patients. And we found interesting report because regarding total motility, when you have 35 years old and younger, you have more chance to have better results. When you have body mass index inferior to 25, total sperm count, motility, and progressive motility, so these three parameters are different between who is less than 25 in body mass index and who is more. The supplementation works better 
in those kind of patients. This is why we are presenting this paper at the upcoming ESRM Congress uh, this fall, and um, the conclusion of the paper is that the supplementary product seems to be more effective in aged less than 35 and with normal weight. So this is again confirming what we are saying about the importance of lifestyle and having a correct uh, and not having comorbidities. So it's really interesting. And for the future, we are planning to continue our research because we, are, we already did a new protocol and um, with this new protocol we try to solve the problems of the previous researchers. And um, at this time we will focus on um, DNA fragmentation and at the moment we did the protocol and uh, in October 2018 we will reach the ethical committee approval. Then we uh, start the enrollment in November and we think that in, no in December 2019 that we will have the final results of this new research and we can present to you even the correlation between DNA fragmentation uh, index and uh, the effect of supplementation. Again in a double blind placebo controlled study because we want to reach results that are real. So, as for any drugs, clinical efficacy of any compounds must be demonstrated by double-blind placebo control. This is the conclusion. And for the future, these are some future perspectives, because just to, to talk together, which is the future of the male fertility? For sure, proteomics is something really interesting. We are talking about proteins, we are making qualitative and quantitative analysis of the protein, and um, we already started making a map of the proteins that are involved in the spermatozoa, where are they located and which is their function. And we already started on the rats making some researches and we already found that there is a strong correlation between the overexpression and the lower expression of some proteins after and before the varicoselectomy. So proteins could be the future for this kind of research and we have to focus on this for sure in an upcoming future. Thank you. <laughs>